In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life, come and dwell within us. Cleanse us of all stain and save our soul for a good one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Kelsey, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Father Hezekiah. Our speaker this evening received his Master of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary and his Master and Doctorate in Philosophy and Theology from the University of Oxford. His Master's thesis, Newman and Gadamer Towards a Theory of Religious Knowledge, was published by Oxford University Press. A convert to Catholicism, Dr. Co Thomas Carr served as Professor of Philosophy and Religious Studies at the University of Mount Union for 17 years and now lives with his wife and children in Northern Virginia. And we're so excited to welcome Dr. Carr to the Institute for the first time ever. Welcome, Dr. Carr. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you, Kelsey, for that uh, warm introduction. Thank you, Father Hezekiah, for inviting me to speak tonight on Newman and Conscience. <clears throat> I just want to start my, my uh, clock here so that I'll give at least the appearance of caring about the time. Um, and I wanted to start before I jump into the lecture with a prayer from St. Newman that he composed himself. It goes like this. Dear Lord, help us to spread your fragrance wherever we go. Flood our souls with your spirit and life. Penetrate and possess our whole being so utterly that all our lives may only be a radiance of yours. Shine through us and be so in us that every soul we come in contact with may feel your presence. Amen. Amen. So on October 13th of last year, tens of thousands of people traveled from all over the world to crowd into St. Peter's Square to witness the canonization mass of Blessed John Henry Newman. Now, Newman was the first Englishman to be raised to the altars in over, six, in over 300 years and his cause was some 60 odd years in the making. It was hindered only by the second of two required miracles, but that came in May of 2013. A young woman by the name of Melissa Villalobos, who was pregnant with her fifth child, she's a Chicago native. She was pregnant with her fifth child and it was a rather difficult pregnancy and she had been confined by the doctors to bed rest. And unfortunately, at this time, her husband was away on a business trip. Her children were downstairs watching television. She lay down for a nap in her bedroom. She woke up in extreme pain, surrounded by blood, and she felt that she was dying. Now, just a couple of days before that, her husband had handed her a prayer card. It was a card of John Henry Newman. She remembered his kind, smiling face, and so she cried out a prayer, and these were her exact words, please, Cardinal Newman, make the bleeding stop. Instantly, the room that she was in, her bedroom, filled up with a scent of roses. The pain went away, the bleeding stopped, and an ultrasound at the hospital later that afternoon confirmed that a miracle had taken place. Five years later, Blessed John Henry Newman was Saint John Henry Newman. Now, celebratory responses came in from various facets of the Catholic world. Predominantly, it seems, from the, shall we say, the more leftward-leaning side of the Catholic theological spectrum. Uh, on the eve of his canonization, articles in both the National Catholic Reporter and the Jesuit periodical America praised the decision, calling Newman a saint for our time. A Catholic writer in the Irish Times wrote that Newman should be considered the patron saint of the postmodern searcher. Now, there are several reasons for this adulation of more liberal leaning Catholics for the canonization of John Henry Newman. Um, one is that Newman was considered to be very pro laity, and that certainly is true. He penned an article in 1858 entitled uh, Consulting the Faithful in Matters of Doctrine. It got him into a little bit of trouble with his bishop, uh, but Newman was really in favor of an educated laity who had courage of conviction and who had enough confidence in articulating the doctrine that they could speak out to their priest or to the bishop whenever they got off track. So we were talking about some of the reasons why 
more liberal leaning Catholics considered Newman to be a saint for our time and we're all excited about his canonization. One was that he's considered to be pro laity. Uh, secondly, Newman has always had an interest in the ecumenical movement. Now, we need to clarify that for Newman as an Anglican, what that meant was bringing the Anglicans, the Catholics, and the Orthodox together to the table to discuss theological common ground. And as an Anglican, he thought that these were the three branches of the one Catholic church. Now, as a Catholic, he knew that wasn't the case, but it's far removed from the kind of ecumenism that we have today, where all the religions come to the table and they're looking for some sort of elusive commonality. Uh, thirdly, Newman's doctrine of a theological development, how doctrines change over time as they move through different eras of history, has been thought by some liberal Catholics to be supportive of radical change in doctrine. Right now, as we speak, there is a synod going on in Germany. Many of you are probably aware of this. And some of the German bishops and theologians are using little bits and pieces of Newman's theory to uh, support things like women's ordination, the blessing of same-sex unions, the ending of clerical celibacy, things of that nature, none of which Newman would have countenanced himself. Uh, and if you want a very thorough and orthodox interpretation of Newman's theory of doctrinal development, then uh, go to ICC, to the archives. Just a few weeks ago, Professor Chad Pecknell gave a brilliant lecture on that essay. So uh, recommend that. Fourthly, Newman's religious epistemology, his theory of religious belief or knowledge, which is outlined in his 19, uh, 1870 work, Grammar of Ascent, is thought by some to support a kind of Catholic subjectivity or a Catholic relativism even. And, and to be fair, Newman does give quite a bit of room to the subjective side of the knowing process, but there's a lot of objectivity in there as well, and he's very far removed from something like a relativist. Nevertheless, uh, these features of Newman's work are thought to line up well, not only with a more progressive Catholic agenda, but also with the reform agenda of Pope Francis. And nowhere is this truer than with Newman's theory of conscience. In uh, 2016, Pope Francis wrote an exhortation, Amoris Laetitia, a document which many of you know of, has become quite controversial, and it mentions conscience no less than 14 times. In the much debated chapter eight on divorce and remarriage, Pope Francis writes, and I quote, conscience can do more than recognize that a given situation does not correspond objectively to the overall demands of the gospel. It can also recognize with sincerity and honesty what for now is the most generous response that, be, that can be given to God and come to see with a certain moral security that it is what God himself is asking amid the concrete complexity of one's limits, while yet not fully the objective ideal." End quote. That's section 303 of chapter 8, a rather infamous section. Now, some have sought to connect the Pope's view of conscience as stated here, that is, as providing a certain moral security in situations that yet fall short of the Church's objective ideal, with Newman's own view of conscience. Oxford church historian and papal biographer Austin Ivory tweeted that, and I quote, one cannot help but imagine that Cardinal Newman, a famous opponent of papal infallibility, not, not really true, would delight to be canonized by a pope who admits mistakes, calls himself a sinner, dislikes being put on a pedestal, and has restored the role of conscience, end quote. Cardinal Kupich, the Archbishop of Chicago, in a 2018 speech cited both Newman and Amoris Laetitia in support of the view that, and I quote, the voice of conscience could very well affirm the necessity of living at some distance from the church's understanding of the ideal, end quote. So both Ivory and Kupich suggest that with respect to conscience, Newman and the Pope are on the same page. Indeed, Newman's famous after-dinner toast, 
and I quote, I shall drink to conscience first and to the Pope afterwards, end quote, suggests that Newman might indeed favor a view of conscience like that of Pope Francis, that when conscience and church teaching conflict, conscience ought to prevail. But is this a fair assessment? Are Pope Francis and St. Newman really in agreement on the rights and authority of conscience? This is the question I want to ask in our time together tonight. First, I want to examine the concept of conscience itself. Then I'll I will outline uh, Newman's theory of conscience, and I'll conclude by answering the question that we just raised. If time permits, we'll take a brief look at an example of Newman's own conscience in action as narrated in his Apology of Pro Vita Sua. Before we begin, I wanna make two preliminary remarks. Um, first of all, there are two distinct conceptions of conscience in Newman's writings. There is conscience as a argument for the existence of God. It is Newman's form of the morality argument. And then there's conscience as an essential facet of our day-to-day -day Christian life. I'm gonna focus on the latter concept and we'll save the former one for a, a different talk because that's really worthy of its own treatment. And, and secondly, Newman is not a systematic theologian. Let's, let's be honest. Um, he doesn't even call himself a theologian. Newman is many things. He is a brilliant stylist and just a master prose, uh, brilliant in the English language. In fact, one thing I just learned about Newman is that he had a dream of translating the entire Bible into English, but his bishop told him not to do that. I imagine if we had had a Newman Bible, it would be brilliant. Uh, he was a brilliant stylist. He was an, uh, an apologist of the first rank. rank. He was a, a great letter writer. He was a great polemicist. He was many things, but he was not a systematic theologian. Now, what that means is that he, never, he nowhere treats conscience in a step-by-step -step fashion. We have to kind of pull the bits and pieces together from different writings and present something to you with a little more uh, form to it. Now, speaking of sources, there are three primary sources we would turn to to pull together this doctrine of Newman's, uh, Newman's doctrine of conscience. There is the aforementioned Grammar of Ascent, the 1870 work. It's his most philosophical work. It was 20 years in the making. He considers it to be his magnum opus. Uh, Newman outlines his epistemology, his theory of knowledge in that book, and conscience forms a key part of that. And then in 1875, he wrote a very lengthy letter. Um, we'll talk a little bit more the, about that letter in just a moment, called The Letter to the Duke of Norfolk. And in that letter, he has two sections, two chapters, where he defines at least the foundations of conscience. And then thirdly, his uh, 1864 uh, Apologia Pro Vita Sua, which is his theological autobiography, a book that has a uh, very dear meaning to my heart because it was the book that led me to the Catholic Church. Uh, now, in that book, he doesn't describe or define conscience explicitly, but he does illustrate conscience with some very big moral choices that he made in life. So if we have time, we'll look at that at the end. Now, the, con the concept of conscience itself comes to us from the Greek Stoics, third century BC philosophers, Seneca, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius. Plato and Aristotle don't mention conscience by name, but they do describe and define some of the key components of conscience, like moral deliberation, moral self-awareness. The New Testament, however, picks up conscience quite uh, readily. It, it is mentioned 30 times in the New Testament, most of which come in Paul's writings. And it is also mentioned in several church fathers. It's mentioned quite uh, extensively in some of the scholastic theologians like Thomas Aquinas, of course, and St. Bonaventure and others. Uh, the Greek word for conscience is soon a desis. The Latin word for conscience is conscientia, which we get our English word from, and they both mean the same thing. Knowing with which tells us a couple of things if we want to play a little bit with the etymology of the word, and that is that conscience is a, a rational function. It's a knowing, 
And it is something that involves something or someone other than the self. It is a knowing with something other than the self. Now, traditionally understood, conscience operates in three distinct modes. I'm calling these, just for the sake of convenience, the theoretical mode, the practical mode, and the judicial mode. The theoretical mode is comprised of moral first principles by which, by reference to which, and engagement with which we deliberate morally whenever we find ourselves in a moral situation that requires such deliberation. The practical mode is where we apply those first principles to the situation that we find ourselves in in order to make a choice. You know, this is the, the, the mode where you have a little devil on one shoulder, a little angel on the other, and each one is trying to, you know, move you in his or her direction. Um, the practical mode is where those moral first principles of theoretical conscience are applied to the moral situation we find ourselves in. We make a choice and then we act. We perform a moral act, which leads then to the third mode of conscience, the judicial conscience, in which judgment is made on the act that we just performed. If we have acted in line with the principles of theoretical conscience, the judgment is thumbs up, right? Approbation, approval, good job. If we've acted out of line with those moral first principles, it's a thumbs down. Blame, guilt, you've, 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 not, you've, you've violated the norms of conscience. We find these three, quite interestingly, I think, uh, illustrated very nicely by St. Paul in Romans chapter 7. He doesn't mention conscience in this particular context, but he illustrates it quite nicely. So Paul says that in Romans 7, I delight in the law of God in my innermost being. That's theoretical conscience, right? Moral principles on the inside of us. But I can't bring myself to live them out. That's the practical conscience. And here, having a real problem, applying the principles in a way that I can actually follow them. Oh, wretched man that I am, right? That's the judgment of conscience. That's judicial conscience in action. Who will rescue me from this body of death? So now this analysis of conscience leads us to a big question. And our answer to this question will help us to sort through three different types of conscience, three different general categories that we can place conscience under. And the question is this, where do those moral first principles come from that comprise the theoretical conscience? What is their source? What's their cause? There are three different answers to that question. We can talk about a theistic answer to that question. Now, a, a theist is someone who believes in God, believes that God created the universe, and believes that God is still in some way active in the universe. God is still intervening in the affairs of men. God is performing miracles. God is inspiring us with his presence and so on. The theistic view of conscience suggests that those moral principles that are within the theoretical conscience come from God himself. He has placed them within us. In fact, he himself is inside of us. He is the one who is speaking those moral principles to our heart, to our mind, to our soul, whenever we find ourselves in a, moral, in a moral choice that we have to make. He's the one reminding us of the Ten Commandments. He's the one reminding us that we ought to do good, we ought to avoid evil, and so on. That's the theistic view of conscience. That is, of course, the view of the Catholic Church. If you look at the Catechism, uh, 18, sorry, 1776 to 1802, those sections, long answer about what is conscience. And as you read through, you will be very aware that the Catholic Church teaches very clearly that the moral principles of theoretical conscience come from God himself. Secondly, there is the deistic view of conscience. Now, a deist is someone who believes in God. God created the universe, but God has, is not involved in the universe any longer. God has Give the, has given the universe a big shove, but has let it run its course. Now, the deistic view of uh, conscience believes that human reason is created by God. It is a product of the 
uh, the, the material forces that God put into nature. God, God created nature with everything it needed to bring forth rational, conscious life. And here we are. But the deistic view of conscience is that it, it is up to us using our reason alone to develop the moral principles that will occupy our theoretical conscience. This was the theory of Immanuel Kant, an 18th century German philosopher and his uh, categorical imperative, right? His, his uh, project was to try to put conscience within the bounds of reason alone. And his categorical imperative suggests that, you know, whenever I'm in a moral situation, I need to act by that maxim, which I would want everyone else to act by, given the same set of circumstances. That's a, a rational approach to the moral first principles of theoretical conscience. And then thirdly, there's the atheistic view of conscience. Now, an atheist, of course, is someone who does not believe in God. And so those moral first principles of theoretical conscience must come and can only come from material sources. There are several suggestions for where they might come from. They might come from the surrounding culture, for example. That was Freud's view, right? The view of the superego, that we adopt the social and cultural mores and norms of our surrounding village, and those become the moral first principles of theoretical conscience. Or if you're an existentialist, you simply make them up <laughs> as you go. You, know, you are free to create your own values. You're free to create your own moral principles. Uh, if you're a Darwinian, you would say, oh, the moral first principles are simply products of evolution. They're products of the survival of the fittest and so on. Okay, so that's the atheistic view. Now, where does Newman stand? Which view does he hold? Of course, <laughs> it, I shouldn't even have to say it, but Newman holds the theistic view. And this is seen very clearly in his letter to the Duke of Norfolk. And just a bit, brief bit about the context of that letter. It was penned in 1875, but back in the 1860s, um, blessed Pope Pius IX, who was a very good Pope in many respects, was having a very difficult time with the church. He was having a very difficult time with just about everything in his life. In fact, he was losing papal states right and left from all sorts of Italian skirmishes. Uh, the great Italian general Garibaldi was building an army, was threatening to sack Rome. Uh, he was having all kinds of internal problems. You know, this is the age where German historical criticism of the Bible is beginning, and it's undermining confidence in the scriptures and, and then in many of the teachings of the Catholic faith. That's beginning to creep into Catholic universities, into Catholic seminaries, causing all kinds of problems with his curia. Uh, Darwinism, you know, 1859 was the Origin of Species publication, and it, that was the end point of 20 years of debate on the subject of evolution. So it was very much in the, in the atmosphere of the day and uh, undermining confidence in Genesis 1 and other parts of the Old Testament. Uh, the cultural revolutions of 1848 and their legacy afterwards, the Marxist revolutions, brought all kinds of new ideas into the theological discussion. Anyway, all, all that's to say that he was having a very difficult time. On two occasions, Pius IX sought exile. <laughs> you can imagine that. He first asked if he could go to England. England said, yeah, come on. And then he changed his mind. He asked if he could go to Bavaria. Bavaria said, yes, come, we'll take you. And then he changed his mind. To his credit, he stayed put in Rome. But here's what he did. In 1864, he published the Syllabus of Errors, a long list of anathemas, including Darwinism, including Marxism, including higher criticism of the scriptures and so on. A very courageous document in, in our day, especially. And then in 1868, he called Vatican I. Two years after that, the doctrine of papal infallibility was promulgated and, and ratified, and that helped to centralize power in Rome, in the Vatican, and really shored up his authority. Really helped quite a bit. Um, now, in response to that, a, a British political leader named William Gladstone in 1874, this was after he had been prime minister and it was before he would be prime minister again. He had two stints. Uh, Gladstone, very smart guy, took it upon himself to write a very long book 
railing against the Catholic Church in general and against Cardinal Newman in particular, Newman, the most famous Catholic of the day. Now, Gladstone's argument was that, you know, if, if Catholics have to be subservient to an infallible pope, then they can no longer be good citizens of the state. They can no longer be good subjects of the queen. And, you know, th th those were, that's what he was saying in this long book. Um, he argued that if the pope is the master of the moral life of Catholics, then he's master of their civic life as well. It was not a very uh, respectable book by any measure of, of anyone's standards. He misquoted the Pope several times. He put words into the Pope's mouth that the Pope never spoke. He misquoted Newman's writings and so on. It was just kind of a mess, but it was very influential. Now, Newman had been himself, had been quiet for the five years uh, preceding this event. But once Gladstone had that publication, out and it was selling quite well, he knew he had to act. So he took up his pen and in a couple of weeks, he wrote out a 150 page rebuttal entitled Letter to the Duke of Norfolk. The Duke of Norfolk is a friend of his and came from a long line of Catholic recusants and great guy in itself, but he doesn't factor into the document. Uh, so <clears throat> here's what Newman said in the letter to the Duke of Norfolk about conscience, particularly about the theoretical part of conscience. We have to kind of put this together from different bits and pieces in that document. And I like to think of it as a kind of argument. That's how I've structured here. And the argument goes like this, from the letter to the Duke of Norfolk on conscience. Premise number one, God possesses an ethical character. And I quote, God has the attributes of justice, truth, wisdom, sanctity, benevolence, and mercy, end quote. Premise number two, God is the creator. And as our creator, God puts this ethical character into our minds, our intellect, in the form of moral principles. Now here Newman quotes Romans 2, 14 and 15. The Gentiles have the law written on their hearts with this conscience bearing witness to it, end quote. This leads to two conclusions. Conclusion number one. The foundation of conscience then is, and, and we're talking here about the theoretical conscience, the foundation of the theoretical conscience is the voice of God within us. It is a supreme rule. It is divine, objective, absolute, and inerrant. And here Newman quotes both Saints Augustine and Thomas Aquinas in support of that statement. And he has a long list of things that the theoretical conscience is not. It is not culturally constructed. It is not self-created. It is not an exercise of reason alone. It is not a byproduct of evolution. It is, and I quote, the voice of God in the nature and heart of man. That's what he's describing as the theoretical conscience. And here's a, a, a lengthier quote of his. <clears throat> conscience is not a long-sighted selfishness nor a desire to be consistent with oneself, but it is a messenger from him who both in nature and in grace speaks to us from behind a veil. Conscience is the aboriginal vicar of Christ, a prophet in its formations, a monarch in its peremptoriness, a priest in its blessings and anathemas, end quote. Conclusion number two, it is therefore never lawful to disobey conscience. To disobey conscience is to disobey God. Here Newman quotes the fourth letter in council, and I quote, whoever acts against conscience, let him be anathema, end quote. St. Thomas Aquinas had made the same point. The Vatican II documents of Dignitatis Humanae and Gaudium et Spes would make the same point at a later time. The catechism, our present catechism, makes the same point. Here's Newman again, and I quote, This law, as apprehended in the minds of individual men, is called conscience. And though it may suffer refraction as passing into the intellectual medium of each, and that's a theme we'll come back to in a minute, it is not therefore so affected as to lose its character of being the divine law, but still has, as such, the prerogative of commanding obedience. Obedience, big theme for Newman. The divine law is the supreme rule of action 
Our thoughts, desires, words, acts, all that man is, is subject to the domain of the law of God. And this law is the rule of our conduct by means of our conscience. Hence, it is never lawful to go against our conscience, end quote. Now, that's Newman on the theoretical conscience, the foundation of conscience, the moral first principles of conscience. They come from God. They are the law of God. As for the practical and the judicial modes of conscience, we have to turn to the grammar of assent. In the grammar of assent, Newman tells us that in addition to storing the God-inscribed first principles of morality in theoretical conscience, conscience plays two additional roles. The first role he calls that of critic, what I'm calling the practical conscience. Here, conscience evaluates our circumstances in light of the divine law within us and applies the law to those circumstances. And here's something unique to Newman. He makes clear that this mode of operation is complicated by human subjectivity, which is to say, as we engage with the theoretical conscience in the circumstances we find ourselves in, our upbringing, our culture, our social status, our level of catechesis all come into play. Things, these things color the way our practical conscience operates. So for this reason, the critic or the practical conscience is not always a straightforward judgment, but can depend on certain pre-rational, we might say, operations of the mind. In another context, Newman would call this the illative sense which simply means a conscience in each person takes the shape of that person, which may not be the same shape as the divine law. That's important to keep in mind. And here, here's Newman again, I'm quoting, conscience is a personal guide and I use it because I use myself. I am as little able to think by any mind but my own as to breathe with another's lungs. Conscience is nearer to me than any other means of knowledge and as it is given to me, so also it is given to others, end quote. This reminds us of Newman's famous aphorism or maxim, egotism is true modesty. It doesn't mean that Newman is an egotist or egoist. It simply means that admitting our human frailty, our human finitude, our subjectivity, the limits of those things are essential starting points for the search for truth. It also forms the basis for Newman's argument for an objective, authoritative, infallible magisterium. If I'm so frail and fragile and trapped by my own subjectivity that I have a hard time finding truth, I need the firm authoritative response of a church that can speak to me for God, right? That's, that's Newman's argument. It's a beautiful argument as far as I'm concerned. And then this leads us to the second key role that of judge, what I'm calling the judicial conscience. <clears throat> in this mode of conscience, we experience an interior judgment upon our moral choice, the choice we made in the practical conscience, which assigns either approbation or blame, thumbs up or thumbs down to that choice, and which in turn evokes emotion in response to the judgment. So if our choice lines up with the principles of theoretical conscience, we are judged approvingly, and we experience, in Newman's terms, inner peace, inner lightheartedness. We can think of St. Paul's phrases of such things as the clear conscience, having a clear conscience, having a good conscience. And if we don't, we get the thumbs down. We feel guilt, distress, regret, shame, self-reproach, what Paul would call a seared conscience or a defiled conscience. Now, in this third mode, we see Newman offering us another unique spin in his doctrine of conscience. He tells us that it is God himself who serves in the role of judge. God is the lawgiver at the front end of conscience. God is the judge, the back end of conscience. And I quote, conscience excites all these painful emotions, confusion, foreboding, self-condemnation, and on the other hand, it sheds upon us a deep peace, a sense of security, a resignation, and a hope, which there is no earthly object to elicit. If the cause of these emotions does not belong to the visible world, the object to which our perception is directed must be supernatural and divine, end quote. That's from the Grammar of Ascent. <clears throat> 
That supernatural and divine object evoking emotion by means of the judgments of conscience is, of course, God. So here we have God playing two roles in Newman's theory of conscience. He front loads conscience with moral first principles of the divine law at the beginning of the process. He back loads conscience by acting as judge over our moral acts at the, at the back end of conscience. So for Newman, God uh, uh, play, uh, forms these two poles of objectivity in conscience, the front end and at the back end, the theoretical conscience, the judicial conscience. And in between, we have this area of subjectivity, surrounded by, protected by, two poles of objectivity. So three things then should be clear from all of this description. First of all, for John Henry Newman, conscience is built on the absolute objective reality of the laws of God. There's just no, way get a, no getting around that. Its moral commands are inerrant and always true. It is what St. Augustine called, and I quote, the divine reason of the will of God, which commands the observance and forbids the disturbance of the natural order of things, end quote. Second, conscience operates in individuals differently due to greater or lesser degrees of apprehension of those laws. John Henry Newman draws a distinction between the moral first principles of theoretical conscience and the reception and application of those principles in practical conscience. In the latter mode, errors can enter into the operations of conscience. Errors from misunderstanding, from sin, from pride, from ignorance. Maybe I'm not aware of, because I haven't been catechized well enough. This leads us then to a third critical point. And Newman has a lot to say on this point, and we won't because we don't have time. For conscience to operate properly, conscience must be formed properly. This is a big emphasis, as I just said. Formation is the key to what John Henry Newman calls having a, an educated conscience. An educated conscience does three things. It loves the divine law within theoretical conscience. It seeks from love to abide by that law in its day-to-day -day applications of the practical conscience. And it experiences appropriate emotion in response to the evaluations of the divine judicial conscience. In, in the letter to the Duke of Norfolk and, and elsewhere, um, Newman lists out what we might call formation influencers. Several things that he th thinks are essential to a proper formation of conscience in the life of the Catholic. Number one on the list is scripture, sacred scripture. Some of you may have read his novel, Callista, which is a, a brilliant novel describing a third century woman, pagan woman, who witnesses the persecution and, and horrific deaths of the martyrs around her. She uh, takes up the New Testament, begins to read the New Testament, and as a result in Newman's writing, he's spelling this out very clearly, her conscience begins to change. It begins to develop new moral principles. She begins to see this persecution in a whole new light. She becomes a Catholic. She becomes a martyr herself. It's a, it's a beautiful story. So scripture for sure. Uh, reading and study of church doctrine, church history, church fathers, the lives of the saints, a lot of the things you probably already know. Um, attending mass, not only for the reception of the Eucharist, but also for the visual reminders that we get in the, in the, in the church of our faith right? The statuary, the, the beautiful symbols, the, the crucifix, essentially. Seeing Jesus come down into the host. These are visual reminders that stimulate the imagination that in turn edify the moral principles within us. It, it's it's uh, essential to have these moral reminders of our faith. Um, fasting, other forms of mortification, and last but certainly not least, having good friends. Newman was a very good friend, had a lot of very good friends. Even his Anglican friends who were really upset when he became a Catholic still maintained their friendship with him later on in life. Many of them, not all of them. But they were essential to his, uh, to many moral choices that he made in life. One of the first people he would go to was a very close friend of his, uh, Frude, Harel Frude. And, you know, he would discuss things with him before he would discuss them with his own priest. So here's a question. <clears throat> 
and, and now we're getting back to the original question that we started off tonight with. Would Newman support the Pope's understanding of conscience in Amoris Laetitia? Let's remind ourselves of what the Pope said in section 303 of that, of chapter eight. The Pope stated that conscience not only recognizes when we fall short of God's ideal, it also recognizes what God really wants from us, despite our falling short, and without any reparation of our falling short, there's no mention of repentance, even to the degree, even to the degree of having a certain moral security. Now, would Newman agree with this? No, he would not. Newman takes a theistic view of conscience. For John Henry Newman, God is at the front of conscience as lawgiver. God is at the back end of conscience as judge. God is both the author and the arbiter of conscience, mandated, uh, mediated in the middle by our human finitude, which requires formation. Which is to say that for Newman, conscience objectively tells us what God's ideal is for us, and we are judged by conscience, God himself, for living up to or falling short of that ideal. By contrast, Pope Francis in Amoris Laetitia displays what we're forced to call a deistic view of conscience. Now, let, let me be clear. I'm not calling the Pope a deist. He's not a deist. He believes in miracles. He believes in the resurrection and, and the whole nine yards. No problem there. But if we study the 14 mentions of conscience in Amoris Laetitia, we're forced to draw a conclusion in that direction. Now, there is brief mention uh, of conscience involving the voice of God and moral deliberation. There is that at the beginning of the document. But it seems clear that the Pope believes that, he, he also believes that we are free to determine for ourselves, using our own reason, what God would have us do in particular moral situations which may not rise up to the ideal of the church, which may conflict with the teachings of the church. Now, I, I think it's fair for us to keep in mind that Amoris Laetitia predominantly is dealing with Catholics who are divorced and have remarried. And this is often, from a pastoral perspective, a very complicated situation, requiring a great deal of discernment. And the Pope gives a lot of, I think, very valuable advice in that direction. Um, there are varying degrees of moral culpability in any kind of relationship like that needs to be sorted out very carefully by authoritative church uh, uh, prelates. But if we took this theory and applied it to other kinds of beliefs that we find in the Catholic faith today, for, for example, um, what about the 52% of practicing Catholics who support abortion? What about the 69% of practicing Catholics who support same-sex marriage? What about the 91% of practicing Catholics who support contraception? These are moral situations, and if they're left to their own reason, uh, it doesn't seem like they're coming to the right conclusions, right? They're not lining themselves up with the moral first principles of the divine law and of natural law that God has written. It's therefore crucial to know whether the Pope holds to the deistic view of conscience, or are we simply misreading Amoris Laetitia. To help us with that, we can turn to a second document, which was also written in 2016 in response to Amoris Laetitia. And I'm talking now about the, the document that was written by four cardinals called the Dubia, a series of questions. And that's all they really were. They were simply raising questions about some of the meaning of some of the sections, the more controversial sections of Amoris Laetitia. It's been over five years since that document was published and it has yet to be answered, <laughs> but we'll leave that aside. Uh, now, one of the dubia is directed, is directed to section 303 that I read at the beginning of our talk. And it goes like this, and I quote, does one, it's, it's in the form of a question, so keep that in mind. Does one still need to regard as valid based on sacred scripture and on the tradition of the church the teaching that excludes a creative interpretation of the role of conscience, I'll define that in a moment, that it, and that emphasizes that conscience can never be authorized to legitimate, to legitimate ex exceptions to absolute moral norms, 
the divine law and the theoretical conscience that prohibit intrinsically evil acts. Sorry, I didn't read that very clearly, but I think you, I think you got the point. Now, the phrase creative interpretation of conscience is lifted out of uh, St. John Paul II's brilliant uh, essay, uh, Veritatis Splendor. And he has a whole section on conscience in that, which I very much recommend. And uh, by creative interpretation of conscience, John Paul II means that this is a form of conscience that seeks to prioritize the subjectivity of practical conscience over and above the objectively uh, binding principles of the theoretical conscience. So my own reason over and above the divine law, divine command. The dubia is asking in effect, is this your view, Pope Francis? Is this, th this, this uh, creative interpretation of conscience where subjectivity takes precedence over the objectivity of church teaching? Is this your view? Is this what you hold? Because that's what the question is asking. Is your view of conscience, Pope Francis, one where personal choice outweighs obedience to the laws of God and the teachings of the church? Now, of course, to ask this question implies that the authors of the dubia believe the answer is yes, or they're hoping it's not, but they're awaiting clarification. It's worth noting that John Paul II, St. John Paul II himself, defines conscience as, and I quote, a moral judgment about man and his actions, a judgment either of acquittal or of condemnation, according as human acts are in conformity or not with the law of God, end quote. That's St. John, uh, John Paul II. This is the same view that we saw with Sean Henry Newman. Newman was very sensitive, we have to, we have to say, Again, very sensitive to the particularity of the person. I don't clarify Newman as a personalist, by the way, but I do feel like he has a lot of sensitivity to personhood, <laughs> to our existence as people, as humans. Uh, but as we've seen, in placing the moral absolutes of theoretical conscience and the inerrant judgment of God in judicial conscience on either side of that subjectivity, and in tension with the particularities of our subjectivity, he clearly gives priority to obedience over and above the, what he would call the right of private judgment. Pope Francis's uninterpreted un, uh, description in section 303 sounds like the right of private judgment, which is a Protestant principle, and it was the principle that Newman fought against his whole life as an Anglican and as a Catholic. He was very much in both camps uh, uh, about uh, obedience, prioritizing obedience. Okay, so um, we have a little bit of time. I want to end by um, looking at an example from Newman's own life, taken from the Apologia Provia Suta, Sua his autobiography. And again, it's the book that brought me into the Catholic faith. And it also developed in me a love for John Henry Newman. <laughs> I have to say, I've had a man crush on him ever since. That was 30 some, something years ago, maybe not that many years, but it was a while ago. Uh, I followed Newman to Oxford uh, to do my doctorate. I ended up in the same college by choice as Newman, Oriel College. He was senior dean of Oriel. I was elected junior dean of Oriel. Uh, he was the, uh, he, he, he preached in the college chapel. I had the opportunity and the great blessing to preach a couple of times in the college chapel. So it was just following in his footsteps ever since. And uh, it's been a love affair. Love the fact that he's been canonized a saint. But, uh, not but, and in the Pro Vita Sua, Newman gives us several examples of his conscience in real life action, where he's wrestling in his conscience over some moral choice. The one that really stands out the most, and which is the longest winded story in the book, is Newman's conversion itself. It's a story that takes place in three distinct chapters. So back in the 1830s, Newman uh, was uh, uh, commissioned to write a book for a new series on the church fathers. 
He hadn't really studied the church fathers to any great degree. He was 32 years at the time or in his early 30s. And he had been gifted a huge, beautiful set of church fathers by his students. I can't imagine any student of mine spending that much money on, uh, I don't know how much it cost back then, but anyway, he, get, he got this beautiful leather bound set of, of church fathers and he wanted to master the church fathers. So he took on this assignment and he decided to study the Arian controversy of the fourth century, which, you know, it, brilliant right? It, it involves theology. It involves asceticism. It, it involves church politics. It involves intrigue and all kinds of great stuff. So he's, he's researching this, and he notes that there, there are these three distinct camps in this Arian problem the church went through in the fourth century. There are the Arians, who sort of go way off into left field, we might say. There's the Roman Catholic Church, which holds firm and fast under St. Athanasius's leadership to orthodoxy. And then there's this group in the middle, the semi-Arians, they come to be called. Now, he's kind of reflecting on this in his own life, and he realizes that, well, okay, the Arians are a lot like the Protestants, right? The Lutherans, the Calvinists, the Reformed tradition. The Catholic Church is the Catholic Church. It's the same church then as it is today. And then there's this group in the middle, which reminds him of the Anglicans, <laughs> this kind of group that's a little bit Catholic and a little bit Protestant, not really Catholic, not really Protestant. And he, he realizes that the Arians are heretics and the semi-Arians are heretics. And he's an Anglican. If the semi-Arians are heretics and he's a, a, you know, in the middle, he's also a heretic. This pricks his conscience. You can see him wrestling with this. He sort of sets that aside for a little while. And in the late 30s and early 40s, he gets involved in the Oxford movement, a movement of, uh, where he and some friends are trying to push the Anglican church closer and closer to the Catholic faith, trying to make it more Catholic. And Newman is convinced that the Anglican church is just as Catholic as the Church of Rome. They're just different branches of the same thing. Now, he's trying to hammer out the unique place of the Anglican church. He calls it the via media, the middle way between the radical Protestants on the left, and the Catholic Church on the right. He can't do it. He, he realizes that the theological arguments that he's writing about, and his, his pamphlets and his essays are selling in the thousands of copies, they're not very strong. And that also hurts his conscience, begins him to think. By the time the Tractarian movement, as it was called, the Oxford movement, was shut down, 1841, I think it was, after Newman wrote the last of the great tracts where he is really trying to show that the Anglican church is the Catholic church and it's just not working, he, he feels he has to really make a big choice. So his conscience leads him to uh, resign from his preaching duties at St. Mary's University Church across the street from Oriel College. He just can't preach in the Anglican church anymore. He resigns his teaching fellowship at Oriel College, which is a huge deal because that's his livelihood, that's his office, that's his students, many of whom became Catholic under his, under his teaching. Um, and he, he moves a few miles out to a little town called L Littlemore. Littlemore is a beautiful little village today, and it's very quaint and, and very enjoyable place to visit. It's a good hour's walk outside of downtown Oxford. And there's a little monastery there, and he, he holds up with all of his books. If you've ever seen Newman's library at the, at the Birmingham Oratory, there's a picture of Littlemore. Uh, if you've ever seen Newman's books or a picture of Newman's books, they number in the tens of thousands. He has a huge library. But anyway, he takes them all out to Littlemore, and he starts working on the essay uh, of the development of doctrine. Because Newman realizes that if he can provide a structure for why the Catholic Church has changed so much over time, you know, why the doctrines of the Catholic faith have developed, and why some of them, at least, can only be hinted at in the scriptures, rather than, you know, fully explicit. They're not. They're not fully explicit. How did that happen? If he can come up with a, a working theory that would enable him to say, yes, they are not innovations. They are not corruptions, which, are, which is what 
the Protestants thought they were. They are genuine developments of the deposit of faith that Christ gave his disciples. Then his conscience is telling him he's got to become a Catholic. In uh, April of 20, uh, 20th of April, 1845, in a letter, Newman wrote, it is difficult to know whether converting to Catholicism is a call of reason or of conscience. It was, in fact, both. It was his reason that pricked his conscience and led him into the Catholic faith. And on October 9th, 1845, in a little chapel in Littlemore, and you can go there and visit it yourself sometime, uh, Father Dominic Barberi uh, received Newman into the Catholic faith. And the rest is history. All right, I will pause here and uh, turn it back over and uh, answer any questions that might come up. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Carr. Um, you certainly gave us a lot uh, to, to chew on, I think, in this lecture. And, um, you know, I think a lot of us will come away with the opportunity to reflect on our own um, kind of moral development. And uh, I particularly liked how you spoke about how the how to form one's conscience, you know, the sacred scripture, attending mass and um, fasting and mortification and friends. I think all of us can recognize in our life when those influences have really positively helped us and perhaps when a lack of those opportunities, um, we're really thirsting for something more. Um, and we can pray for those who don't have those opportunities yes. easily accessible to them. All right. Well, um, Dr. Carr, I see that we're getting a lot of people writing in with their gratitude for your lecture. And um, let me just pull up our questions and see what's come in. Let's start with um, this one from, from Nesty. Nesty is writing in and is asking if you could speak on um, what the view of, Ang of Anglicans today is regarding Newman. How would they see, see him and his writings? Thank you, Nesty, for that question. And, and it's a good question. It's a very interesting question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I think I can summarize the, um, what we might call the mainstream view of Newman by uh, turning to a little biography of Newman written by Owen Chadwick. Now, uh, Professor Chadwick was very active when I was at Oxford. He was at Cambridge, but well known in the field of uh, early church history and so on, but he was um, also a great biographer of many uh, church uh, figures. And he's, he's an Anglican priest, as well as a professor of church history. He wrote uh, probably this, the, the most uh, well, um, the, 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 the most popular, <laughs> most popular biography of Newman and the uh, easiest to read, I suppose. Now, here's Chadwick's take on Newman. I'm, I am in very much disagreement with Chadwick's view of Newman in, in, uh, in many respects, but it's an interesting take. Chadwick feels that Newman uh, was trying as an Anglican to push the Anglican church in a more conservative direction. And for Newman, that meant pushing it in a more Catholic direction, uh, higher forms of worship, greater emphasis on the sacraments, stronger belief in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, uh, more regular observance of the sacrament of reconciliation, and so on. <clears throat> he got frustrated in that act, according to Chadwick, because the, the Anglican church was just too liberal. They kept turning him down. They kept silencing him. The bishops, uh, and, and this was certainly true, the bishops uh, put an end to a lot of Newman's Catholic writing uh, and so on. There were simply too many people becoming Catholics under his tutelage. He became a Catholic and he discovered the Catholic Church was too conservative. So Newman became a Catholic in order to try to push it in a more liberal direction. This is Chadwick's take. So he was promoting the laity and he was pushing for ecumenical discussion and you know, he's, he's formulating this, relig this theory of religious belief that takes subjectivity into account. And the bishops shut him down again. <laughs> so Newman loses two, in two cases, as an Anglican and as a Catholic, according to Chadwick. Now, that's part of the story, but certainly not the whole story. And 
Newman is certainly not trying to push the Catholic Church in a more liberal direction. He is trying to make some reforms in the Catholic faith uh, in an age when the Catholic authority structures were becoming more centralized in Rome for reasons that we discuss and reasons that make a lot of sense, but that we're leaving um, the, the little guy kind of out in the cold. Newman had a heart, and this is one of the key um, elements of his spirituality. Newman had a heart for the, the simple person, the common person, the poor, the elderly. There was a part of him when he was in his 30s that wanted to leave Oxford altogether and take up a country parsonages, par parsonage uh, to get married, raise a family, and simply serve the, the poor people of a little village somewhere as an, as an obscure, unknown Anglican priest. That was a dream of his for a while. He was talked out of that by his good friend, um, and Mother Mary had a big role in, to play in that as well. She said, no, you can't get married. You've got to stay celibate. Uh, but nevertheless, um, so Anglicans in Newman's day really sort of saw him as a kind of this is a harsh phrase, a twofold loser. He was a loser as an Anglican because he couldn't make the church conservative enough. He was a loser as a Catholic because he couldn't make it conservative, uh, liberal enough. Now, it, this is true that he did have a, a rough time when he became a Catholic for some 20 years. He, was, he couldn't find his place. Um, he was given the opportunity to start a, a university in Dublin which got off to a great start and then collapsed. That was a big disappointment. He was offered the ed editorialship of a very popular periodical called The Rambler. It was too liberal at the time. He was brought in to make it more conservative, but he didn't. He, he kept publishing uh, articles that the bishop disagreed with. And so, you know, he was having a difficult time until he published his Apologia Pro Vita Sue in 1864. It was so popular and it really sort of restored his reputation in England. Now, sorry, back to your question. Um, what is the Anglican view of Newman today? This was published in the 1970s, I think, or early 80s. So we'll consider this to be kind of a prototype of the modern view of Newman. Twofold loser, <laughs> according to the Anglican church, I'm afraid to say. Now, Interestingly, at his canonization mass, um, Prince Charles was there, the Archbishop of Canterbury was there, former Archbishops of Canterbury were there, and rightly so, because Newman is a representative and a very fine one of the British people. So to that extent, he is a national treasure. But I think the Anglicans were sorry to see him go to the Catholic faith, and then the Catholics weren't quite sure what to do with him. <laughs> so he never really found a home. He was made a cardinal, you know, the last 10 years of his life as a sort of honorific at that point, I think. He didn't like going to Rome. He didn't like spending time with other cardinals. He, he was invited to be a paratus at, the, uh, at Vatican I, and, uh, which would have been a great honor. He was only a priest at that time. He was invited to come and give theological consultation to the various, you know, workings of, of the dogma and so on. He turned it down. He, was, he, he said he was just too, too shy to be around all those prelates. He much, would much rather be among the poor there in Birmingham where he served as a priest. I'm sorry, that didn't really answer your question in a sort of round, roundabout way, but uh, twofold loser, I guess, is what we might say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Teresa is writing in, and she is wondering, how can we know that our conscience deliberates and decides according to objective truth and not our subjective notions? Good question. Yeah, very good question. The, Newman has uh, a process that he would put himself through if he ever found himself in a situation where he wasn't quite sure that he was living up to or, or making the right moral choice in light of the divine moral first principles of, of theoretical conscience. Uh, and, and he gives us this example. He said, what if the Pope, what if the Pope uh, made a rule that 
Um, I, I'm sorry, let me back up a little bit. He, he gives this example. Let's say there's a just war that breaks out between England and France. And the, the prime minister and the queen of England are calling all able-bodied men to uh, line up and sign up for the military and go off and fight against the French. And then the Pope, at the same time, makes a rule that all Catholics are to be pacifist. No Catholic is to serve in any military. Here he has this conflict, right, between what he assumes to be a infallible mandate from God and a civic duty, which seemed to him to be a just and fair requirement. So he said, what am I going to do in this kind of case? Here's what I would do. Number one, I would, uh, and, and he tells us that in that particular case, he would have to disobey the Pope. He would have to go with what, because it was just, it was fair, it was in line with what he understands divine moral principles to be. And here's what he would do. He would first go confront, uh, consult his friends. First thing. So he's going to go to his uh, very committed, devoted, devout, holy friends and ask them what they think. Secondly, he would go to his bishop and have a good long talk with his bishop about what he ought to do and lay out with his bishop his moral dilemma. Um, thirdly, he would consult any holy priest or holy layman that he knew that could give him some guidance. And fourthly, but not last by any means, he would uh, consult scripture and prayer. So that was kind of his process. If ever he felt he was maybe not in line with the moral principles of theoretical conscience, this was his backup plan. <laughs> Good question. Great. Yes, that's very helpful. Thank you for that answer, Dr. Carr. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's all that we have time for tonight. It's been really a pleasure to be with all of you tonight. And Dr. Carr, I specifically want to thank you again for your time and your um, wonderful lecture this evening. And uh, I hope I don't put you on the spot, but I was wondering if you might conclude us in prayer with the prayer that you started with. It was so beautiful. Yes, absolutely. Happy to do that. And thank you all for coming tonight and being a part of this. And thank you, Kelsey, for your uh, mediating our talk tonight. Really appreciate it very much. I, I've had a great experience and I'm a big fan of ICC. We share its message wherever we go. And we have a lot of, we're, we're in Northern Virginia, which is where a lot of folks are, uh, a lot of big fans. Okay. Thank you. Um, so let's, let's pray. This is a prayer that, uh, this is actually part of a lengthier prayer. And if you Google prayers of John Henry Newman, you'll come up with some brilliant, beautiful literature for your own devotional life. I recommend doing that. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, help us to spread your fragrance wherever we go. Flood our souls with your spirit and life. Penetrate and possess our whole being so utterly that all our lives may only be a radiance of yours. Shine through us and be so in us that every soul we come in contact with may feel your presence. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.